while perspectives are unique what i have realized in my sales journey is there are principles or you can call them tenets that remain universal you know whether you're selling shampoo whether you're selling macbooks whether you're selling a car there are few principles that are according to me just foundational to sales that all of us need to know and quite honestly i wish someone told me those principles when i started because i learned them the hard way i learned them by failing by trial and error so those are the principles that i'm going to be speaking about in the course of my presentation there are five principles and what i'm also going to be doing additionally is backing each principle with a sales war story which is a story from my sales life that way you get to benefit in real time from my experiences sales is 70 to 80% listening and then 20 to 30% talking and this research is quite fascinating because when you enter the sales world you assume that you will just be talking pitching and selling and that's not the case in sales your first order of business is listening now when you join a sales organization there is a process called discovery when you meet your client for the first time you ask him or her a set of questions the questions usually revolve around the budget authority need and timeline and then you have further questions after that during according to research and off late i've been obsessed with data according to data the most successful sales representatives invest the most time in discovery so let's say they have a one hour call or a one hour meeting 20 to 30 minutes is invested in discovery discovery is nothing but you asking the right questions to your clients and your clients answering those questions because when you ask the right questions to your clients and you listen and you listen to them loudly i know we are used to the term talk loudly but when you listen loudly you recognize the problem statement of the client you recognize the pain you recognize the exact requirement and that will only only and only come from listening so in sales 80% to 70% is listening 20% to 30% is speaking let me supplement that with an example i was on a virtual meet with the, a pretty large indian organization and i say pretty large in our world 10000 plus employees is large and uh, we got we got talking uh, you know i was getting to know her and i finally got to what she was looking for and i asked her this client kept stressing that you know jeevan my organization is going through a lot of transitions my employees are under a great deal of stress they need someone to talk to transition stress need someone to talk to and she made these three statements thrice in the course and that was a pretty long discovery it was at least a in the one hour call 30 to 40 minutes i was just listening to her asking the questions and listening to her when she brought up these three salient points now this product that i sell ekin care essentially is an application it's an aggregator app that sells everything health and wellness so we got health checks we got doctor consultations we got gym service we got ambulance on demand anything health and wellness we offer on the app through our partners because i heard her and as i say because i listened loudly employees are going through a transition there's a lot of stress and they want someone to talk to the only service line that made sense to her was the mental wellness piece or the employee assistance program and that is all that i spoke about that's all that i spoke about mind you we have 15 odd services and the pitch itself takes 45 minutes but because i heard from her that they are only looking at this particular because i heard the problem statement from her i listened loudly i realized that from our 15 services there's this one service line that addresses this problem statement so that's all i spoke about and we got into the roots of it that is the beauty of listening and listening loudly so every time you are with the customer ensure at least when it's the first few meetings ensure that you're the one listening and the other one talking if you're the one talking and the other one listening clearly there's something wrong yes there are clients that don't give out much 
and say, you know, show me what you have. I'll then let you know. But that's 20%. If a customer is serious, they will tell you what they want and you will tailor your service based on their requirement. So when you look at this principle of listening, you realize that sales is not essentially about selling, but it's about addressing a problem. But you will not know the problem until you heard your client out. So the number one principle in sales is listen and listen loudly. And based on what you've listened, you match the product or service of your organization that addresses that need. When a sales rep knows the ins and outs of his product or her product, when a sales rep intimately understands the product or the service they are selling, it inspires a greater deal of confidence on the other side, which is two clients. A practice five star hotels follow is uh, every time they onboard a sales rep or every time they onboard an employee, they give them unfettered access to their portfolio of hotels. Let's say there's the Taj group, a Taj employee, obviously a white collar Taj employee will enjoy unfettered access to Taj amenities. We're talking suites, we're talking the bar, we're talking the pool, we're talking the food. Why? Because these employees are representing Taj and they are selling Taj to prospective clients, right? Now, if as an employee of a five-star hotel, I don't know what life in a five-star hotel is like or what staying in a five-star suite is like or what an infinity pool, what drinking by the pool or what dining service is like, how can I sell the product? How can I sell the service? How can I inspire confidence in my customers? Right. So all of these five star hotel employees are highly empowered in that respect and they own their product. And because they own their product, they can recommend sweets, they can recommend foods, they can recommend restaurants to the clients coming in. That's the beauty of owning your product. Another example I'll give you here is that of Starbucks. If you've ever been to a Starbucks outlet, and I'm sure all of us have at some point, the baristas, the baristas are the employees or the Starbucks partners at the outlet. They know, they're all coffee nerds or coffee passionates. They know their coffee inside out, their coffee and their food. So when you're talking to them, you're talking to an educated individual about coffee. You tell them, you know, Ronit, today I feel like having something a little less acidic, something that's strong. They will give you recommendations, right? Because these guys know their product inside out. In fact, Starbucks baristas today even conduct these mini workshops at their outlets where they invite you, you know, sir, can I show you something? That's the beauty of owning your product because when you own your product, you inspire confidence in your clientele and you can even recommend what to go for. All the organizations I've been with, at least the product organizations, including WeWork, Health Finding, and Ekin Care, all of these are product organizations. CBR Krishman was service organizations. It's always easier to experience the product when you own the product. So when I was with WeWork, Health Find Me, Ekin Care, I'll speak about Ekin Care and Health Find Me. They are apps. And the moment I joined the company, I began extensively using the apps. Even before, I, in fact, at Health Find Me, even before joining the company, I used the applications. Now, when I've used the applications and I know it intimately during client calls, when there are technical questions and you will get technical questions, you will not be able to address the questions until you've experienced the app, the product or the service yourself, right? That is the importance of owning your product. So whatever you're selling, whether it's an Audi, whether it's a shampoo, whether they're a pair of headphones, whether it's coffee, you need to first experience a product yourself. I tell my, I tell people, you need to sell the product to yourself first. You need to be sold on the product first before selling it to customers. And when you sell the product to yourself, you will have questions. You need to address those questions and then go back to your customer. So own your product. That's the second principle. You don't want to be in a position saying, you know, sir, I don't have an answer to this right now, but let me come back to you. That is the worst point in any sales rep's life. You need to have the answers at the tip of your fingers and the only way to do that is by owning your product intimately. While humility is important, I'll say something else that your clients appreciate is passion. 
passion, energy, animation. It is, uh, you, you want to meet a sales rep, you want to meet someone that's high on energy, that's passionate, right? Because passion inspires passion, energy inspires energy. So I'll say passion and humility, both the same time are emotions that you need to harbor while selling your product or while talking to a customer. Because a client will always appreciate someone with high energy and with infectious passion. This is perhaps my favorite. Favorite because uh, while in sales, we are all behind deals. Behind the deal, which is representing the deal, are people. And those people are humans at the end of the day. Right? I know in sales, we're all about targets, numbers, prospects, but we need to empathize that behind those, behind that deal, behind the rupee value, whatever, 10 lakh deal, 15 lakh deal, there is a person sitting. So what I do is, in Know Your Customer or KYC, there are two elements here. One is the element of the customer, which is, let's say, let's say Ronit's my customer. And if I were to do a KYC on Ronit, there is Ronit, the individual, and then there is Ronit's organization, which is a, so what I would do before meeting Ronit for the first time, I would look Ronit up on LinkedIn. Today, 95% of the world is on LinkedIn. LinkedIn has been promoting that they have 1 billion members, which is, which is fantastic. Of the 1 billion, 815 million are from, no, 100 million are from India. So chances are everyone's on LinkedIn. I look Ronit up on LinkedIn. I look at Ronit's education. I look at the firm Ronit was with, Ronit is with, how many years has he been with the firm? I also look at mutual connections. What I'm essentially trying to do here is find common ground. If I have a common connection with Ronit, during my interaction with Ronit, I'll say, you know, Ronit, you and I are connected with Rajesh. So how do you know Rajesh? That's me making an attempt to break the ice with Ronit before I get to business. Or I say, Ronit, uh, you, so I see that you're part of this group called Toastmasters. Or you follow the Bill Gates page. You know, I love Bill Gates myself. I follow his book recommendations. I'm essentially finding an opening with Ronit before I get to business. And Ronit will appreciate that. Right? Ronit will be like, okay, wow. You know, yeah, let's speak more about it. I break the ice and then I get to business. That's the beauty of knowing your customer. So when you're meeting someone for the first time, you need to do more research on the person you're meeting. Of course, you need to do research on the company as well, which is, when it was founded, the founders, the business model, revenue, if they're in the news, all of that. But the first meeting or the first couple meetings, you need to know the person representing the brand more than the brand themselves. As the meetings progress, the person itself will inform you about the brand and you can do your research. But you need to know the person you're selling to. And I always like to do a little more research about the person because Everyone likes to speak about themselves. Everyone likes to know and sing praises about themselves. Dale Kamji says, our favorite word is our name. So imagine I made an attempt to know Ronit better. Ronit will appreciate that and he'll perhaps be more favorable to me in a sales dealing. So that is the third principle, which is knowing your customer. There are two aspects here. The customer itself, which is the human, and then the organization. You need to do your research on both and LinkedIn pretty much does the trick. If you want to do a little more research on the company, then you've got to look if they are in the news, whether it's the Economic Times, Times of India, Hindu Business Line. Check if they're in the news, read their articles so that you're informed when you're still there. In the sales world, there is this acronym that we follow, BANT, Budget, Authority, Need, and Timeline. Yeah. In my experience, the one thing customers in India are very shy about are budgets. They almost always never tell you price. Uh, I, I that's that's how the Indian mentality is. But if I were to give you, yeah, so budget is one. If you don't get budget authority, when I say authority, are you the decision maker? If you want the decision maker, what's the hierarchy like? If you're speaking to the administration official. His boss, which is head of admin HR, and then the HR's boss, which is say the CEO or the CHRO, what's the hierarchy like? So that's that's the first, which is authority. Then is need. Need is what are you looking for? What is the actual requirement? Let's say, you know, Amit's in real estate. Someone's looking at 
10,000 square feet of office space. That's the need. 10,000 square feet of office space in DKC in Mumbai. And then there is timeline. Timeline is by when are you looking at picking this up? Do you want it by the quarter four of this year, which is December 2023? Or do you want it by the quarter one of next year, which is March 2024? Right? So budget, which is what's your budget towards the product? Authority, where do you stand in the pecking order? Need is your actual ask. And then timeline, by when do you want it? So these four are staples when you're having a conversation with the client. And then depending on the industry or in the product you're selling, you'll have more questions, but bant are the staples. I ask the client, right? In my first call with them, I tell them once I've shared a proposal, should I follow up with you within a week? Within two weeks, I ask this and I keep it open-ended and they say yes. If their answer is yes, I follow up with them within a week. A few customers say, you know what, G1, we are closing our books. We are doing payroll, blah, blah, blah. So reach out to me in a month's time or two months time. I reach out to them in two months time. It's important when you're interfacing with a customer and you've shared the price to establish when you'll be following up. So you tell them upfront that, uh, Ankur, now that I've shared the proposal with you, I'm going to call you sometime in the next week. I hope that's all right. Right. So that's you affirming or them confirming that you will follow up with them next week. And when you call them next week and they sound a little surprised that, oh, you're following up, you tell them, hey, Ankur, uh, so you said you asked me to follow up with you in the coming week, right? So I thought I'd give you a call. What you're doing here is the context from last week, you're extending it to this week. So the client is not like, Aap mujhe call kyu kar rahe ho? I'm calling you because I asked you if I can call you in this week and you said yes. So every time I call Ronit for a follow-up, I say, Ronit, uh, we spoke last week and uh, you said now would be a good time to follow up. So where are we on the team? So Ronit can't say, call me later because Ronit itself confirmed, call me in a week. So that's the way I go about following up. But ask the client, when would be a good time to follow up? Establish that. Clients will say one week, two weeks, three weeks. Don't follow up with me. I will come back to you. Respect that and use that when following up with the client. That's my advice on follow-ups. None of us operate in a monopoly. We all operate either in a duopoly or multiopoly, if that's even a word. There are several competitors in the market. And uh, when a client is meeting me, the client's also meeting my counterparts, which is everyone selling the same product or service. Chances are at any given point in time when you're selling your product, there are 10 or five other sales reps selling the same product to the same client. Hence, it's important to know your competitor. In my experience, products and services in the same space largely remain the same. 80% of the time, we offer the same thing our competitors offer. Of course, what differs is pricing a little bit on product quality, turnaround, but 80% is the same. Now, in the space that we operate, which is wellness, health and wellness, our competitors are Practo, Visit, Connect and Heal. These are competitors in the same space. All of us, we do the same thing. Someone is cheaper, someone's more expensive, someone's turnaround is better, someone's network is perhaps more superior. But more or less, like I said, 80% are the same. The 20% edge that EkinCare has is that we have a patented dashboard. And this dashboard is, you can call it very much like we have HR dashboards like Keka and Darwin Box. This is a wellness dashboard where whatever is happening on the application, the employers, which is the HR folks will have access to. Let's say Stanley has utilized a doctor consultation. Ronit has gone in for a health check. Someone else has utilized ambulance on demand. The HR will have real time access through that dashboard of the usage of these services. You have usage, you have analytics, you have demographics, you have several dynamic features. Now, I know that this is what Ekin Care has that my competitors don't have. So every time I'm in front of my client selling my product, there are clients that ask you upfront, Jeevan, how are you different from your competition? And that's when I say it. Even if clients don't ask you, it is imperative that you highlight how your product, your service is superior than the market.
which is your competitors in the market. Because at the end of the day, it is that 20% that will give you an edge over your competitors. So whether your clients ask you how you are different or how are you better or not, make it a point to highlight how your product or service is superior when compared to the rest. And call it out. Say, this is something that only we offer. Our competitors don't offer it. That needs to be etched in their minds. So that is knowing your competitor. And for that, you need to know what you offer versus what your competitor offers. LinkedIn is the first filter where you get to know about both your customer, which is both the individual and the company. I will then say to get to know more information about the company, you go to the company's website. That's the second. Read up about the company. Third is follow the company on the news. If it's a listed company, what are they trading at? What has been impacting their share price? If it's a private company, what are their revenues? Have they picked up funding? What these companies usually do is if they are featured in the news, they will have it on their website. They will have it on their web page. So that will be my third, which is follow the company on the news channels, which is either you can either Google the news or if whatever your source of news is, Economic Times, Times of India, Hindu, Business Line, follow them there as well. And one more thing I'll add is tap your network and see if anyone is in touch with a com- with this company. Let's say you're talking to LNT because LNT has several. Let's say you're talking to LNT Financial Services. See if someone in your network is working at LNT Financial Services or has served LNT Financial Services as a client. Have a word with them. Ask them what it's like dealing with LNT. How long did they take? How is the company to work with? Are they good when it comes to paying on time? Are they? You know, you, what's the tenure they deal with? I think that's another one. So to summarize, after LinkedIn, you have the company webpage. You got the news outlets, and then you pick the phone and speak to people that have either served the company, are working with the company, or know the company. When it comes to the individual, LinkedIn is pretty much enough. LinkedIn gives you everything about the individual. And uh, yeah, so with individuals, LinkedIn is good enough. And like I said, India has 100 million people on LinkedIn. So chances are 98% of the people are on LinkedIn. So you can do your research about the client on LinkedIn. This is my favorite this is my favorite because uh, in in sales, in the earlier su- slide, I said that when you're meeting your clients, chances are the client along with you is meeting five or 10 of your competitors, right? And the client is tired of listening to the same product, same service, same price, more or less same product, service, price. And they'll listen to the same thing from 10 or five different mouths. So what gives you an edge? Being relationship first gives you an edge. I'll give you an example. Two months ago, I was on a virtual call with a client of mine. This was a pitch call. It wasn't a client yet. I was on a virtual call. And uh, during that call, I heard a lot of barking. There was a dog barking in the background. So I just... It was a pretty long call, one, one and a half hour. And I I just happened to mention the client. So, you know, uh, the dog seems to be very eager to join our call. I just said that jokingly. And then he said, uh, oh, Jeevan, that's that's actually my dog. I hope that's not disturbing. I said, no, 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 not all, sir, not all. And then I, I indulged him. So which breed is your dog? He said, my dog is a Shih Tzu. I said, oh, wow, you know, you're into small dogs because Shih Tzu is a small, petty breed. He's like, no, I had a golden retriever, but... You know, he passed away and hence I've got a small dog now, which is the Shih Tzu. And his name was Simba. He also told me his name. I asked him about the dog's name. And we got chatting for for at least two, three minutes. We got chatting. You're telling me, you know, Simba is getting restless lately. His mother's not at home. So I've got to take care of him. And we built a relationship. So before going back to the call, which is because this, this happened during the call, before going back to the call, I said, you know, sir, I'd love to see Simba. His video was off. So he said, sure, I'll WhatsApp video call you after our meeting ends. And I said, sure. Now, I wasn't really expecting him to WhatsApp video call me. I really wanted to see his dog. And I said it. He, after our meeting ends, he WhatsApp video calls me and he shows me his dog. And Simba is a lovely, lovely looking dog. Very cute. And you should have seen his face. His face was lit up. 
obviously i couldn't see his face during the business call but i'm sure it wasn't as lit up as it was now because he was talking about himself and his likes which is his dog and i have a cat myself so i showed him my cat and we bonded over that right now let me come back to the last principle which is relationship first this same gentleman is speaking to five of my competitors which competitor stands out jivan or the other five right jivan has made an attempt to build a relationship with me so i would obviously privilege jivan over everyone else right so that's the beauty of being relationship first business baatein hoti rahegi you're going to continue talking about business you're going to continue selling and trust me all of your clients are tired of being sold to they're listening to the same thing from everyone so you being relationship first which is actually caring about their life about their aspirations about what they enjoy doing will give you an edge against your competitors so that's the beauty of being relationship first and i want to end this by saying that in life and this is very true this is a research they say you're either relationship oriented or you're transaction oriented now i am relationship oriented and that's why i lead with my heart before my head and i always try to build a rapport with anyone before i get on a call that way i get to know them i get to break the ice and then get to business so you need to figure who you are you can't be in the middle you can't be a hybrid you're either relationship oriented or you're transaction oriented and in the sales business relationship always wins i authored an article on linkedin yesterday which says you may lose the deal but don't lose the relationship right now a deal for example i lost a deal just on thursday and i was bummed because i worked on that deal for two months it was a pretty sizable deal but i am still maintaining my relationships with the client because it's not entirely in the client's hand to give me the deal there's a management involved there's a budget there are several parameters that go into a yes or a no and there's only so many parameters that i can influence while i've lost the deal i've retained the client and the client i'm sure will be happy to come back to me if things with the competitor whoever they've gone with doesn't work out they'll be happy to recommend other clients to me i've built my goodwill with the client because i'm relationship first and i'm nurturing that relationship so that's the beauty of being relationship first even if you lose the deal you don't lose the relationship you don't lose the client